You can go. Thank you, Shana. Alors, uh, bonjour à tous. Good morning, everyone. My name is Kevin Delavasbil, Director of Communications of Aero Montreal. I am very pleased to be your host today and proud representative of Suzanne Benoit, President of Aero Montreal. On behalf of Suzanne, I want to thank you for joining us today for this webinar on the COVID-19 and the aerospace supply chain. This event is part of a new series of webinars proudly organized by Aero Montreal in collaboration with a longtime and valued partner, Aviation Week. We have also had the privilege of collaborating with them during our last editions of the International Aerospace Innovation Forum. We are very fortunate to welcome a wide range of experts who I'm sure will be most interesting. So with us today, Joe Anselmo, who will be today's moderator. He is editorial director of the Aviation Week Network and editor-in-chief of the Aviation Week and Space Technology since 2013. We also have Michael Bruno, who is Aviation Week Network's senior business editor and community and conference content manager. Also, Jim Amakiotis, who is Vice President Supply Chain at Pratt & Whitney Canada. Also, Alexan, Alexander Verdon, who is Vice President Business Development, Mergers and Acquisition at Ehudeftet. And the last but not least, Alex Cruz, Managing Director of Patriot Industrial Partners. So thank you, gentlemen, for being with us today. We truly appreciate it. So before turning the floor over to Joe, I would like to briefly walk you through the technical details of this session. First of all, please know that all microphones have been turned off to avoid any background noise. If you wish to ask a question during the Q&A session at the end, you will have to submit it in writing. To do so, please click on chat or clavardage and ask your questions to the host, Aero Montreal, or to all if you wish your question to be public. The session will be held in English, but I very much encourage you to ask your question in the language of your choice. Cette session aura lieu en anglais, mais nous vous invitons à poser la question dans la langue de votre choix. Now, the floor is yours. Joe? Thank you, Kevin. Um, I'm Joe Anselmo, the Editor-in-Chief of Aviation Week, and we've been a media partner with uh, Aero Montreal for some years, and we are privileged to participate in this webinar series, even if Michael and I don't get to come to Montreal this year. As 2020 began, uh, commercial aerospace suppliers were being pinched by the grounding of the Boeing 737 MAX, and then came COVID-19, which has devastated airlines, decimated demand for new airplanes, and forced aircraft OEMs to ratchet back production. So how will COVID-19 impact aerospace suppliers in the short, medium, and long term? Will this crisis accelerate consolidation, especially after government rescue packages run out? How are OEMs identifying risk in their supply chains? And what are they doing to make sure key suppliers will still be here when demand rebounds? What will separate the winners from the losers? And what role will private equity play in this crisis? Those questions and more will be tackled by our panelists. We'll start with brief opening remarks from each of them, and then we'll dive into a discussion. We also urge our audience to send in to their questions, and we'll get to as many of those as we can in the next hour. Uh, to uh, reiterate again who our panelists are, Michael Bruno, my colleague, is Aviation Week's senior business editor, and he's our supply chain guru. Uh, Michael has been an editor at Aviation Week since 2004. Prior to that, he was a business reporter at WashingtonPost.com. Jim Hamakiotis is vice president of supply chain management at Pratt & Whitney Canada, a position he has held since the beginning of 2018. It would take me about 15 minutes to cite all of Jim's experience, but suffice it to say that he has been involved in supply chain operations and business development all over the world, including Canada, China, India, and Poland. Our third guest, Alexander Verdone, was baptized by fire in his current position. He joined Her Hero DevTech in February and has supported the company's multinational procurement team through the peak of the COVID pandemic. And has many interesting things to share with us, no doubt. And finally, Alex Cruz is the Managing Director of Patriot Industrial Partners, an aerospace and defense advisory firm that focuses on manufacturing strategy, value creation, and business transformation. He's going to provide us with a detailed and insightful breakdown on the pandemic's implications for the supply chain. So let's get off to our brief opening remarks, uh, starting with you, Michael, to set the stage. 
Thanks, Joe, and thanks for everybody joining us here. It's always a pleasure to get together with Aero Montreal, uh, even if we have to do it virtually these days. But I'm so delighted that we're continuing to move forward and find events for the industry to get together like this. I'm really honored to be here with uh, Jim Alexander and Alex, a uh, couple of real veteran uh, executives in industry and, and a well-known advisor to industry too. So I'm looking forward to their remarks. As Joe said, I'm the business editor at Aviation Week and uh, uh, often that's kind of a background uh, position here. I do a lot of support to other editors because we really like to talk about technology and new aircraft development. Uh, but then as you might imagine, ever since COVID-19 emerged, the business story has become the leading story in aerospace and defense and certainly across the supply chain. What we're seeing is perhaps unprecedented, um, at least nobody since the dawn of the jet age uh, really recalls seeing anything quite as substantial as the impact that's happening to the industry, to the airline customers, to the suppliers, uh, to the MRO providers, everybody, airports, everybody, everywhere in the uh, chain of life of aerospace is being affected by this, and they're all being affected quite dramatically couple of things that I've been reporting on in the past couple of months. Uh, and while I wish they were, there were better news to share, I think it's still worth bringing these up, to sort of help put everything in context. Um, in the very beginning, obviously, nobody quite knew where things were going with COVID-19, but they knew right, at, right away that if you were a company, you needed cash. Uh, we had some major liquidity concerns that have emerged overnight. Companies have been struggling one way or another to make sure they have the liquidity on their books, whether that's raising funds through tapping credit lines, selling debt, issuing new shares, selling off assets, uh, perhaps even selling the whole company altogether. We've already seen some sales that probably be best described as distressed. So we've had that liquidity crunch happen and it's still going on, but I think for the most part, we're kind of past that crisis as a whole for the industry. At least everybody's got some kind of plan that they're working on and hoping that it comes to fruition. We're looking into the midterm and the longer term, we're beginning to see both planning and the real effects of changes happening to the supply chain through consolidation, through workforce reduction, and essentially through programs being chosen as winners and losers and how suppliers are gonna line up to meet those. When it comes to the workforce situation, it's unfortunate, but uh, we already easily see as many as 100,000 jobs going away, at least over the next couple of years. And that's just on the manufacturing side. So that's planned, but permanent reductions in the job billets, uh, whether it's through early retirements work for reductions that are voluntary or involuntary, or just closing down positions that you thought you might once fill, but you certainly can't afford to fill those now. If you include the airlines uh, and airports and other extensions of the aerospace world, you might easily see 200,000 or more permanent jobs be lost. Uh, I'm reminded that just, I think this past couple of weeks, Oliver Wyman said that uh, if Congress alone in the US doesn't pass a new stimulus for the aerospace sector, you could easily see 225,000 jobs lost permanently over the next few years, just on sort of the airline and airport side alone. So we have workforce reductions. We have consolidations. Uh, I've reported that uh, there are a lot of experts who see uh, as much as 20% of the supply chain could exit the business one way or another in the next couple of years. Those exits may be bankruptcies. It may come through consolidation, mergers and acquisitions, of course. And it may just come from choosing to exit the business altogether. Uh, do remember that a lot of the suppliers feed into many industries. And uh, when it all comes down to it, if aerospace and defense is not a profitable venture for them, they can elect to move on and just leave it all together. So one way or another, we're going to see a significant number of suppliers go away. Uh, and there's going to be a lot of consolidation happening. And then finally, we're, you know, 
we know that digitalization is happening within the whole aerospace sector, and it's going to increase and accelerate across the supply chain. I've heard uh, a couple of people separately make the great analogy that every month that we go through this COVID-19 world is the equivalent of a year's worth of digitalization being adopted by the supply chain. Uh, nobody thought once upon a time that their whole workforces could work from home, and suddenly, companies, huge companies, Prime's OEMs have maybe close to 90% working from home. Uh, nobody really thought that additive manufacturing maybe was gonna kick out aircraft parts in a significant amount in the near future. And now I think companies are really starting to think about that in the next three to five years. How do they change their factories and their production lines uh, to incorporate things like big data and connectivity and additive manufacturing? So all kinds of ways that the supply chain is going to change in the long term, and long term being three to five years, but uh, just about everybody expects big changes to come. So with that, I've kind of blathered on too long already. I want to turn it over to the real experts, uh, Jim, Alexander, and Alex. Yeah, Jim. Thanks, sir. Thanks, Mike. thanks, Michael, and uh, thanks for inviting me here, and thanks for all the attendees on, on the phone. I hear we're close to 300, over 300 people here, so thank you for that. You know, so... If I get started, I kind of look back and, I, and I'm sure like most of the people on the phone here, Pran and Whitney Canada, we started 2020 with very solid supply chain strategy, you know, laser focused on um, overcoming all the capacity constraints and the growth in our industry, improving our delivery and cost and performance and, and ultimately meeting our com customer commitments, which um, we weren't able to keep up in the past because of, again, that, that growth, uh, growth environment. We had... We had four pillars at the time. You know, this is something we developed over, over a year ago, you know, focusing on supplier performance, um, being relentless on suppliers that couldn't keep up with us um, as, as we continue to grow, improving our quality and our producibility. Um, these are all capacity drains in, in the network that you can't afford, uh, again, especially in a capacity constraint environment. Working on our demand management, and finally, and most importantly, working on our people, making sure that our people have the right skills and uh, the, the ability to go and develop these relationships that are critical in, a, in an industry such as ours, in a highly engineered, long-term type focused industry. So plan was working quite well last year and we were starting to see a, you know, a comeback of our, of our key KPIs. And then as you said, uh, Michael, um, March comes along and our entire industry gets disrupted. Um, and things that we had planned or were no longer possible. And, you know, to be honest, a lot of people asked me, what do we do with our strategy? The strategy that's been working quite, quite well over the last year, year and a half, do we need to change it? And um, my immediate answer on that was no, you know, strategies need to survive these tests. Um, what we need to go do is pivot. And that's what we, we kind of, we call it pivot the supply chain. Um, pivot means you, you change your priorities and you change the actions that you had planned under each one of those pillars. So we, 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 we maintain those four, the, the strategy that I outlined before, as well as those four pillars, as I call them. And if we get anything out of this webinar today, and I urge, you know, all of all, all suppliers and partners out there is to, you know, as we make tough decisions over the next little while to survive this, um, that we don't compromise the future. You know, the, the business will come back and the actions we take today cannot compromise and put us in a disadvantage when we, when we emerge out of this. So um, we need to keep our eye on the long-term strategies throughout this. So we'll talk, uh, as, as we said, through a lot of the details on what we're going to be doing in this webinar. But if I talk about what I mean by pivot, you know, we're pivoting our, our mindset uh, from being very capacity focused and, and working closely with our supply chain on ensuring that they can grow with us and that they have the, the, the facilities in place, the production lines in place. Um, capacity is not going to be the big thing in the next little while. The big, the big thing that, that we need to be looking at and we need to be looking at together here is, is um, supplier health. Do they have the operational capabilities to keep up and to survive this downturn? Do they have the financial wherewithal and the, the ability to, 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 to make it through? So, you know, we've developed tools, we're working with third parties, we're working with, with Raytheon Technologies, our parent company, to make sure that we're asking completely different questions and putting in programs to make sure that 
we survive through this. Um, we're pivoting our investments. Uh, we used to spend a lot of money and, and energy and our people resources on, on, uh, on capacity and securing our, our fair share of, of, of the capacity in the network. Um, what we're going to be doing in the next year, I would say, is, is and touching on, on what Michael just said, is uh, enabling these consolidations. Consolidations are going to happen whether we like it or not. Uh, You've got to work we got to work with, uh, with your supply chain to make sure that the consolidations happen, that the facility rationalizations that are going to be essential so that companies can put their cost structures back in place, that, that you're part of that. So we're working hand in hand with our supply chain uh, to, go, to go and work on that. We need to pivot uh, how, we, how we set up our, um, our people uh, and our processes. Uh, I'm not saying we got to not work on developing skills of our people to make sure we get through this, but uh, the way we work is, is going to change. You know, people are likely to stay at home much more than we ever thought before. Um, travel is going to continue to be a problem. Uh, we're not going to be able to go and visit supply chain as, as we were before. So we got to make sure that we adapt to that, we stay close to our people, and we give them the tools to be able to deliver. So, you know, before I hand it off to Alexandre, you know, I strongly believe that the companies that will emerge stronger post-COVID are the ones that stay focused on long-term objectives while taking advantage of, of, of this downturn. And yes, this downturn is negative, but we're going to be able to do things that we weren't able to do in, in the last couple of years where uh, we were in a high overdue situation, um, way, be, way behind from our delivering on our customer commits. This is the opportunity to, to leverage this downturn and go fix the things that we, that we had a hard time doing in the past. You know, things like fixing systemic quality issues, those are going to make a big difference when the industry comes back. Optimize your logistics, your transportation networks. There's tons of dollars tied up in that. Um, got, to, got, to work on, got to work on those. Invest in automation, invest in industry 4.0, B2B, mission critical. And most importantly, and you know, we don't talk enough about this, is continue to invest in your people. Uh, the, our industry requires very strong relationships. Invest in those relationships, work with your supply chain as they're making these drastic changes. When the industry comes back, uh, they're gonna remember you and it'll be payback when the industry comes back. So continue to focus on relationships and, and, and your people. Thank you. Jim, thanks for that setup. Um, it has been quite a year for you guys. Uh, Michael and I recently spoke with Greg Hayes, the CEO of your parent company, Raytheon Technologies. and. They closed a merger of Raytheon and UTC essentially over Zoom, finished integrating the companies over Zoom to create the world's third largest aerospace company. So yeah. it's, been, it's certainly been different for all of us. And speaking of different, Alexander, you've certainly been in the midst of this storm. You want to tell us a little bit about it? Sure. Uh, yes, I was in the midst of the storm. I uh, just started with Hero Death Tech in uh, late February. And then COVID hit, so it was uh, like you you said earlier. I was thrown in the uh, thrown in the fire, and uh, I want to share a little bit our our remarks or what we went through. So um, initially, as most of you have seen, uh, it took a long time for the dust to settle and to figure out exactly uh, what the true impact was going to be on to, on the supply chain. Uh, you know, we do believe the, the message have been passed along, and, and most people uh, understand what the impacts will be right now. And what we're seeing is that as people are uh, uh, redoing their analysis, redoing their production planning, uh, and they're trying to figure out how to fill that excess capacity. So there, there might be a, a, a need for consolidation like you've seen or like you've said, uh, and there might be second messages, second ways of, um, of uh, procurement messages coming along as people or, or large, uh, larger tier suppliers are trying to fill their excess capacity. Uh, so it's really important for uh, the, uh, the management of the companies to be focused on, on the health of their suppliers. Uh, so there's, uh, you know, there's a need, uh, you know, supplier management is no longer uh, an annual questionnaire that, uh, that, that people are filling and, and filing. But it truly takes the center stage as part of the uh, of the executive committee and even the board the board meetings. Uh, there's there's a supply supplier watchtower that uh, here at Hegwood Tech that that reviews the suppliers on a regular basis. And there's a supplier watch list that uh, uh, you know we focus. We know 
where to focus on on uh, on our supply chain and who do we need to keep close to. Uh, as you know, as the dust will keep settling, it's important for suppliers to stay close uh, to their their customers so that uh, your supplier understand your situation, understand where you're struggling. Uh, you know, with, and don't just uh, fill out emails or fill out surveys. Give a call to your buyer, explain the situation. Don't tell them that everything's okay. It, it's not okay. Everyone's going to be suffering, and you need to be honest about what your challenges are. Expect to be uh, requested to share your financial statements. Uh, explain a little bit your uh, your liquidity situation as well. What we want to see is we want to see that uh, suppliers have access to cash, have dry powder uh, to face the storm. And we want to see as well that uh, – They've got uh, they've got a good management plan in terms of what if what if there's a contamination happening? What if you've got two, three, four, five percent of your workforce that starts having COVID and you need to shut down for 14 days uh, in order for the, the quarantine to go through? How does that will impact your operation? Will you put a program at risk of, of being late? This is important to have the, the discussion with your buyers. Uh, and, uh, and again, uh, make sure uh, make sure you're ready to discuss your financial situation. We want to see, you know, who's going to be there for the uh, for the medium term, who's going to be able to weather the storm, who's not going to be able to make it, and then you know we, we're going to have tough decisions to make to see: are we dual sourcing some parts, or are we uh, are we looking at exiting suppliers where that uh, doesn't don't seem to have the, uh, the the financial strength to go through the uh, through the storm. Uh, what we've got as well, suppliers that are more openly discussing with us, we're willing to help. Where it's, it's not, uh, it, it's not a make or break decision. You know, we we want to discuss to see, okay, uh, working capital management. What can we do uh, to help you with your uh, receivables? To help you with your inventory levels, as this this could free up some much needed capital uh, for the suppliers. Okay, th thanks, Alexander. Uh, Alex, um, we heard we heard the view from the inside from our last two panelists. Uh, you you interact with lots of companies. So tell tell us your view of the world. Uh, thanks uh, to the Aero Montreal team and Aviation Week for uh, allowing me to participate today. So uh, you know, as as everybody said, and Joe, you el uh, eloquently stated, um, we're in challenging times, but like other downturns, um, the supply chain we're going to get through it. So uh, and we will thrive. Um, so I'll briefly discuss, uh, you know, refashioning the supply chain, maybe some company actions, uh, some reshoring activities, and then maybe uh, talent management. Um, so, uh, you know, as you stated, Joe, uh, you know, our company does focus on manufacturing strategy, value creation, and uh, business transformation. And we're working with companies in all these areas that we're talking about that. So, you know, there's going to be a lot of talk about the refashioning of the supply chain. You know, phase one, there's been a lot of cost cutting and cash preservation actions. You know, phase two, at what I kind of consider is, you know, the, fur uh, the furloughs and permanent workforce reductions that are, that are underway. And then lastly is we're going to be going into, you know, uh, financial restructuring, consolidations, divestures. Uh, so some key things that we might see, and that's maybe some discussion points for today, Joe, is... Uh, you know, I think uh, private equity groups are going to progress from supply chain participants to OEM partnerships. I think that there's going to be uh, some opportunistic and probably some necessity-based uh, uh, transactions uh, that's going to put a further light and put some uh, private equity firms in a much larger, uh, you know, importance from the supply chain uh, with some of these larger companies. Um, also, we might see, uh, you know, what some people say the super tier ones or the 0.5 uh, tier category, uh, you know, such as the, uh, the Raytheons or Saffrons, um, they might move into maybe what's called a mini OEM category. So it'd be interesting to see um, the, those two dynamics of the private equity and those kind of super tier ones. Um, you know, there needs to be a lot of focus uh, and, and I think Jim hit it on the head there uh, with uh, uh, and Alexandre on the operational excellence uh, there's going to be need of uh, first time quality improvements, right? Um, higher volumes allowed for a little bit of masking in the supply chain. And, and now the details is, is really important. Um, balance sheet discipline is going to be really important. We talked about financial, uh, you know, financial wherewithal, uh, credit lines, Michael had, had brought that up. So uh, that's going to be really important, balance sheet discipline. 
um, as uh, these lower volumes persist. And uh, we're probably gonna have lower backlogs uh, for a bit of time. Um, you know, I think that we're gonna see that travel is probably gonna be slower to return. Um, I, I think that there's some aspect of the, you know, uh, COMAX C919 maybe later this decade with their own internal supply chain and maybe that eats away a little bit at the narrow body. So an already kind of uh, reduced backlog may, may be even going a little bit further. Uh, and then obviously we're seeing a lot of uh, geopolitical tensions uh, that, uh, um, you know, uh, you know, it, it's something that, that, that needs to be considered. Um, you know, part of that, those geopolitical aspects is, uh, you know, reshoring of the North American, uh, you know, reshoring to North America. Uh, I think that the new uh, uh, United States, uh, Mexico, Canada agreement, the USMCA that was uh, revisited after NAFTA, I think that's going to be an important uh, aspect uh, for a lot of companies uh, doing work here in North America. Um, and I see this, you know, really as low cost country, uh, you know, costs are rising, right, and have been for some years. Uh, so I think this, uh, this, this situation in COVID uh, might exasperate or, or kind of accelerate some of that movement. Um, you know, obviously risk mitigation with logistics, like Jim had brought up, uh, you know, IP protection. And then there's a lot of discussions, penalties and incentives from the government. So I think that's all going to, you know, play a part in the, this reshoring, uh, you know, through uh, the USMCA uh, potentially. And then lastly, I think a, a great place to end at least my comments on uh, and, and maybe just to echo what Jim stated is uh, talent management uh, during this, uh, these times is really, really important, um, you know, where retention is able to happen, um, but really investing in the people. Uh, the people are the supply chain and, and they're what make the parts and make this go. Um, so, uh, you know, companies are really going to have to, to focus on uh, that while, uh, while making tough business decisions. Okay. Well, thanks for those opening remarks. Um, our audience is starting to ask questions. Uh, why, don't, why don't we grab an audience question really quickly, which is, is, is reshoring a real issue? Michael Bruno, do you want to take a crack at that one? Yeah, I'll do go first and maybe turn it over to Alex. He was also just mentioning this. Um, so it, obviously with the um, ability of new technology to provide your products a little bit more locally and COVID-19 putting a real crimp on travel, not just for the leisure, but also for us in industry getting around. I think it was Jim or Alexander who talked about the difficulty in going to see your suppliers and going to walk the factory floors these days. Can't do it, basically. Um, there's a push toward if not necessarily reshoring, at least a regionalization, or at least I see increased interest in bringing the supply chain closer to home uh, for various reasons. And there's now more ability to do it with technology. And I am reminded by a, a one workforce consulting group, I saw a report just recently, and it listed aerospace and defense high on, the, on which markets they thought could go through a reshoring, and it was mainly reshoring from Asia Pacific uh, back to maybe the United uh, United States, Canada, and Mexico. And that's the critical thing here, as Alex was pointing out. We have the new uh, USMCA deal, the new the NAFTA 2.0. And that was already putting in motion a possible trend where suppliers were going to want to bring some of the supply chain closer back to North America, put it in Mexico, um, possibly in Canada. But uh, Mexico has been a growth trend uh, in aerospace and defense, and it's only expected to continue from what I understand. So the reshoring may not necessarily be back to the U.S. per se, but it could very well be to North America from other continents. Alex, what do you think? Yeah, no, absolutely. And, that, and that's why I wanted to emphasize the, the USMCA, because I think it's just as much as, uh, you know, Canada and the clusters that they have there, all the way down to the southern parts of Mexico, there's uh, great little clusters down there, uh, you know, whether it's uh, uh, Mexicali or uh, other, other, other great little clusters, there's a lot of talent both north and south of uh, the American border. So, um, and I echo what you're saying that, uh, you know, um, for, for various reasons, but bringing it closer to home uh, and again, uh, kind of North American continent, it, I think is going to be uh, accelerated just a bit. The, uh, the term consolidation came up a few times um, in, in this discussion. Um, and I know in Quebec, there's been talk even before this crisis and the max crisis that there was a need for consolidation in the supply chain 
uh, there. Um, are we to expect a, a wave of consolidation in the supply chain? And has government aid sort of delayed that? Uh, government, massive government aid uh, from the US, Canada, elsewhere, has that delayed uh, impending consolidation? Anyone wanna take that one? I think I could, sure. take, a I could take a stab at that. This is Jim. Um, yeah, you know, the first, the second question on government aid has it delayed. I think it's still too early to tell that. I think every company is still trying to figure out where they stand in all this, and our OEMs are just starting to, you know, over the last month or so, firm up uh, their their demand for the short term. So government aid probably has a play, but uh, you know, we're only five months into this. I think these things are need to happen. I think consolidation needed to happen because, as I said in my opening. Um, a lot of the, the medium and small size aerospace suppliers just didn't have the, the capability to keep up. Uh, they didn't have the, the ability to go and invest. Uh, they didn't have the, the, the ability to kind of grow as the industry needed it to grow. So um, I think uh, private equity and others are gonna play a big, needed to play a bigger role on some of these and helping uh, drive more scale. I, I believe that um, this downturn is gonna force that um, quite, quite a bit in the, in the next, year or so. Alexander, you had you wanted to weigh in? Yeah, sure. I will uh, I, I would agree with what uh, Jim's saying. Uh, from what we've seen, the government support has been helping. We see we see uh, a lot of companies that have benefited for the uh, from the payroll protection programs or, or the wage subsidies that we have here in Canada. And are you know they're able to make it through the storm. When you've got seventy five percent of your payroll that's subsidized, it, it does help uh, it does does help the end of the month. Uh, we're feeling that as the as those supports will be tapered off, uh, you'll you'll probably see a, a little bit more companies starting to struggle with their with their cash flows. And uh, I would agree uh, with what Jim has said that you know there's there's a huge impact, huge part of the capacity has been vacated by by the uh, some of the the order cancellations or postponement, um, and that will trigger uh, consolidation for people that are looking to fill that excess capacity. The, uh, the most productive company or the ones with the, the most efficient cost structure uh, should be able to, uh, to be more competitive and to absorb that volume. Uh, so again, like Jim said, I, I believe that the companies that are going to be able to invest in 4.0 in automation uh, of their business processes to become more efficient will be, uh, will be able to consolidate. Alex, both you and Jim had raised uh, the role of private equity, and you noted it, it, it's changing. Do you want to fill us in on, on what you meant? So um, valuations over the last couple of years have been uh, uh, what, what some would say a little frothy. Um, you know, there's been some probably uh, over um, overvalued businesses purchased, and I think that that's starting to uh, come down a bit. Um, so there, I, I think that we're going to see a lot of the, um, the cash and the funds that were on the sidelines kind of waiting and trying to understand, um, because at a certain point, as much as people really like the attractiveness of aerospace defense and the industrial markets, uh, you know, investors aren't going to overpay for, for, for assets. So I think we're going to see some of those cash on the sidelines starting to come out, um, especially uh, funds that are more focused on um, you know, maybe uh, Harrier deals or, or deals that need a little bit of uh, what, what, you know, some would say a little TLC. Um, and so I think you're going to see those funds coming out, plus uh, some of the sideline funds. Uh, and, uh, and I echo that the, uh, the investment's definitely going to be there from the private equity side. Uh, that's, all, that's all about the value creation is, is improving the business and, and getting that, uh, you know, future down the road return on investment um, after improving the business. Jim Alexander talked about some of what they do to uh, assess the viability uh, of the financial health of, of their suppliers. Uh, what, what is Pratt & Whitney Canada doing to ensure that this supply chain can weather the storm? As you had said, uh, we will weather the storm and we'll come out and, and the industry will grow again. What are you doing to make sure your supply chain is healthy enough to do that? Yeah, I think, um, you know, without getting into the nitty, the nitty gritty, um, what we did really early on when this happened, knowing that uh, you know 40% and 50% reductions in, in, in volume is gonna hurt a lot of our suppliers, we put together a tool um, which basically has, you know, before we would be on a weekly basis talking to our suppliers about uh, 
their delivery profiles. Now we've put together, working with uh, third parties such as Rapid Ratings and Duns Dun and Bradstreet, looking at their financials on a on a, on, a, on a regular basis and getting and getting getting reports. The people we have in the field, we have a bunch of people working on um, closer to the suppliers. Those those people, we have them talking again to our suppliers and asking completely different questions that we were asking b b b before. So really, it's new questions. Uh, looking at financials, as soon as we get some kind of indication that there's something not working, um, making sure that we get the, fina the finance communities together, opening up the books, as Alexandre said, and, and making sure that um, we're working closely with our suppliers, um, looking at different solutions, you know, the end, uh, Pratt or any, any, any other customer, we can't go solve all the problems, but there are payment terms and, and other things that we can go do to help suppliers kind of weather it um, and then more importantly keep them alive so if we need to take some drastic actions uh, we, we buy some time so that we can execute on either uh, resourcing activities or doing something different. Um, we have a question from one of our viewers and, and I think this one is, is for Michael or Alex. Uh, are, are there uh, companies out there that are being uh, looking at this as an opportunity to uh, to make acquisitions, uh, as you said, Alex, for, for a less frothy price and uh, expand their capabilities. Yeah, so I, I think in the years past, it was all about expansion of uh, into programs and new customers. But I think we all see that all customers are having a bit of a challenge right now, right? You know, with reduced, whether it's narrow body, wide body, regional jet, um, you know, maybe with the, the defense market as kind of a set aside that, that may be a little bit less untouched. but. Um, I think the expansion uh, or consolidation or acquisitions are going to be more about capabilities. Um, and so where companies didn't have certain capabilities to position their portfolio uh, for the future, uh, whereas companies that were maybe more in components and, uh, and such are more in getting into aero structures or, you know, perhaps, uh, you, know, um, you know, an RTX or Saffron getting into aero structures, right? So, um, you know, just as to throw some things out, but it's just capabilities of the future that they may not have otherwise have thought of before. Uh, there could be a whole lot of other, um, you know, uh, examples to bring up just as, as such. Okay. And just to follow up on what Alex is saying, I, I, I hate to be doom and gloom, but I don't think um, we can underestimate the power of the need to survive right now and how survival is driving all the thought processes across the aerospace sector. And what I mean by that is the good news is there's pretty much universal belief that the long-term prospects for the industry remain valid, uh, that there will be growth again someday in three to five years that the trend of growing middle classes around the world with disposable income and a desire to travel has been proven time and again pa through past crises and is expected to happen again. However, unfortunately, there's gonna be a bit of a, a valley of death essentially for some of the supply chain to get through before we get back to that uptick in growth. And so if you're a prime or an OEM or a tier one even, um, you're looking at your supply chain and you're saying, who do I need to survive? Uh, how do I help them survive? Some may need a little more cash. Some may just need a little bit more work. So I'm going to take work from one supplier and I'm going to give it to this other supplier to here because I'm choosing winners and losers for various reasons. Um, perhaps there's somebody I'm going to go ahead and unfortunately for them, let them go bankrupt, let them go under, and then maybe I come in and get their assets later, or I just try to make sure a competitor doesn't come get those assets. So um, I won't put Jim and Alexander on the spot for people they're looking at, but I believe that those are the considerations that your companies have to go through. I mean, please tell me if I'm wrong. Yeah, I, I, I would say you're, 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 you're bang on. And, and you know, if I, if I talk for our company, uh, you know, we're going through a a, a, a merger, a merger right now at the Raytheon at the Raytheon level. So, um, if if you know in the in the short term, to me, if there's going to be more acquisitions, it's going to be out of necessity. Um, so right now, everybody's we're including ourselves. We're working on making sure that we get through this this lull in in the business. Uh, there may be some suppliers that we can't save, and uh, we we may need to go and do something more drastic, such as acquire. But 
you're right, right now it's all about preserving our position and making sure that we emerge out of this, uh, you know, this next year so that we, so we can set, set the stage for, a, for, for the further growth. Alex, um, I'm sorry, did you want to weigh in Alexander? Yep. Sure, um, I, I would agree with uh, with both uh, Michael and Jim have says, uh, we, we're looking at we're looking at the suppliers we're, we're and it's okay to struggle people are struggling right now it's okay to lose money the discussion we want to have is is what's your plan to come back to profitability and, and make your business sustainable and you know most of the time we believe in the, these plans and we're willing and able to support them uh, if if we see that the the, the, the plan is not sustainable or, or it's, it might be a little bit too late, then uh, what we would be looking at is, is a plan B to make sure that we're able to deliver on our promises, uh, either through dual sourcing some parts or, or, or insourcing if it's the, the very last option. Uh, and, uh, you know, if it's absolutely critical, it could be an acquisition target. But at this time, again, we, we haven't seen that, that need at the moment. Alex, um, we've been talking about survival as a theme here. Uh, you had you had given us prior to this sort of an outline of, of the advice you're giving in the short term, mid term, and long term on survival. You want to uh, sort of capsulize it, encapsulize that for us? Yeah. So uh, 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 that really goes back to kind of manufacturing 101 things, uh, operations excellence, first time quality, uh, balance sheet discipline that I kind of mentioned at the beginning. Um, it, it's really about how now you're running the business uh, in these lower volumes, right? Um, you, you have to obviously look at your banking and financial relationships. Um, I think Alexandre hit it on the head with earlier about talking to your customers. This is the time uh, to be very open, right? Uh, you need to be open and, and share. Um, and I think that uh, in these times, um, you know, your, you know, tier ones and your OEMs, uh, uh, are going to be very supportive, right? And so they're going to help you uh, and help the supply base with, uh, you know, probably some creative, uh, you know, creative things. Again, whether it's, uh, you know, transfer of work, some, you know, make buy type of uh, situations, or even um, they may know of uh, or have a connection to another investor or another company looking to do a merger, right? That might be the benefit for both parties. So I think that there's a lot of opportunities in being very open, but it's, it's really manufacturing one-on-one and communication, I would say, right now. Okay. Guys, we've gotten a couple of questions about um, suppliers that are involved in defense. Uh, certainly in, in, in the U.S., the world's largest defense market, the, the market is still robust. Uh, is that is that helping insulate some of the supply chain suppliers that are not only in commercial but also have a, a foot in defense? I would uh, I would say that defense right now is the savior. Uh, business is strong in defense. We're seeing geopolitical tensions. We're seeing a lot of orders for uh, military jets and helicopters. So it's it's really helping the businesses that are involved in uh, in the military programs. Uh, so short to medium term, uh, I, I believe military is going to be is going to be good. Uh, question is, uh, you know, as the the budget, the governmental budget deficits uh, will need to be closed off at one point. Uh, how is will that affect the uh, the future outlook for military? And we're probably talking three to five years uh, before before these budget cuts hit. Okay. Anyone else want to talk about that? Yeah, I, I would agree with Alexandre. Now, Pratt & Whitney Canada doesn't do a lot of military work, so um, it's not a giant benefit, but from a supply chain perspective, for sure. Um, you know, any supplier that has, uh, who, who has been awarded large military contracts, they're able to de deflect some of their people and, 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 and you know, actually some of, some of the businesses are actually doing better. So it is helping the ones that, are, that do have military contracts. Um, we've got to leverage that and make sure that uh, we use that to kind of protect the, the businesses. And we're actually deflecting even into our own factories some, some military work so that we can keep, uh, keep our factories busy. If I can jump in and, and add one more thing from sort of a short, mid and long term perspective, short term, obviously, as Alexander was saying, military is the savior right now. Uh, they were the guaranteed cash bill payers um, coming in in the, in the midst of the early ugly days of COVID-19. 
and that's expected to continue for the next couple of years because as uh, either Alexander or Jim said, even with defense budget potentially plateauing in the US and in the West, um, the way the money works, the outlays, it takes a couple of years for that to flow through the system. So that MRO in the military world is gonna keep going. But there's one trend that is worth keeping an eye on, which is long-term budgets, as Al Alexander said, are expected to be reined in at some point. And in the military world, one of the bill payers for doing that could be earlier retirement of legacy platforms. So mm -hmm. if um, in the past several years, you can make real money you know, keeping uh, C-17s and C-130s and F-16s flying in the air. Well, there could be a chance that in five to 10 years from now, those legacy platforms are either uh, greatly reduced or not even flying because the military had to make a decision where they were gonna invest in something new and the bill payer is some old 50 year old aircraft that they just wanted to get rid of a long time ago. Okay. Um, Lots of lots of questions coming in. This one a little extraneous, but uh, do you expect the U.S. government uh, will push uh, put some messages out to encourage people to travel more by air? Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I guess I'll take that. I, I think just this morning, I think we saw from Bloomberg this morning there was an article that, uh, and I just briefly looked at it, but. Um, I think that it, there's more data coming out there that it's, it's, it's safe to fly, right? Um, air circulation, the HEPA filters uh, and such. Um, I think what the uh, concerns is gonna be is everything around the flights, right? The airports, getting their uh, lines, that type of thing that are kind of inside, right? So that's the next kind of uh, frontier, if you will. And, um, you know, screenings, are there going to be, you know, testing, you know, before quick tests. So I think a lot of that has aspects, but I think the actual act of flying, at least from what I read and what I see and talk to people is, is, is predominantly safe. It's just probably the situation around it. I wanted to ask you guys, everyone is saying that uh, a return to normal means 2019 uh, production rates and speculating when we'll get there. Is, is that overly optimistic? I mean, some analysis say that Boeing and Airbus really uh, were almost at, at peak production last year, even though everyone was talking about raising rates. Um, it, it, are, are you confident we'll get back to 2019 and then just resume growing on this upward trajectory the industry had been on for close to 20 years in commercial? Michael, you wanna? Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to jump in there because I've certainly heard two different viewpoints on this. Uh, one, Joe, as you were just alluding to, uh, there is some skepticism that um, industry and particularly the supply chain, as we well know, through 2018 was struggling to deliver at the production rates as they were, you know, narrow bodies in the 53, 55 on the Boeing side, Airbus looking at 60 and beyond and the supply chain for various reasons, uh, some of which were the OEM's own faults, you could say, uh, we're having difficulty meeting those rates. And so to ever get there again, let alone surpass them, uh, there's reasonable doubt there. At the same time, um, there, there could be a weird uh, springboard effect where we go through the next couple of really tough years and lower production rates, even lower than what Airbus and Boeing are laying out now, uh, could be even lower production rates. And then all of a sudden you have this dramatic increase in the need to produce new narrow bodies, for instance, um, could be even, even a higher rate than what it was uh, in 2019. Now that could be just for narrow bodies and not wide bodies because the wide body market is expected to suffer a little bit longer. Regional aircraft could be different too and, and business aircraft were still sussing out what's happening there. But individually within programs, it's there's a possibility where you see rates come back even stronger, at least for a short period of time, uh, You know, perhaps the latter half of this decade. Okay. Alexander, there's a, a question that just came over you're interested in answering. The people question. The question that came over is a little bit about how to take care of our people. Uh, I believe, you know, people, your employees have to pay the bill, they have to pay the mortgage, and uh, they're reading the news just like every one of us is. And, and they're, some of them are afraid about their jobs. Question is, is there another, is there another furlough coming? Or uh, why am I gonna, uh, am I gonna be laid off? Is my plan gonna be closed down? 
uh, or merge with another facility. So I, I believe even though you, you probably don't have the, the exact answer right now, just keeping the communication lines open with your employees. Tell them what's happening. Tell them how the business is doing, how the order book is doing, and, and what you're looking for uh, in order to, to maintain these jobs and maintain the business in operation. Uh, it's just going to help them sleep better at night. We have a long but insightful question here from one of our viewers. They're asking, should we expect to see foundational changes in some parts of the aerospace supply chain? And they're noting certain suppliers, such as aero structures, have high fixed costs and relatively low margins. So are we going to see a foundational changes in the supply chain when we come out of this crisis? Anyone want to touch that? Uh, well, I could start with that, Joe. I think um, uh, obviously aero structures is a is a is a first place to start. Um, at higher volumes, you can have more uh, you know more participants in that space. But at the lower margins and 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 these lower volumes, uh, there's probably going to be some consolidation in that space. Um, there's uh, a lot of Southeast Asia expertise. Uh, there's European expertise. There's North American expertise. So a lot of aero structures uh, that's going to be kind of uh, going after a smaller amount of work. Uh, and I think that there's uh, probably some components companies, uh, you know, some components uh, and uh, probably controls companies uh, that uh, uh, maybe weren't faring so well going into this uh, that, that may uh, need some help or, or, you know, some type of mergers uh, or acquisitions within that space as well. So I, I, I kind of see the, those are the two that uh, could have some opportunity for sure. Okay. Alex, can I follow up and ask you a little bit more about private equity's role maybe in driving some of these changes? Because you've really turned me on to the idea about that potential partnership at an unprecedented level between private equity, which traditionally had kind of shied away, particularly at the, the big player role, and now maybe getting involved with the Airbuses and Boeings and, and how that can really reshape the supply chain. Yeah, um, if, if we've looked at the past years, uh, traditionally private equity has gotten into more of the build to print model. Um, everything from the uh, Melrose and GKN all the way down to uh, smaller private equity teams and the metal assembly providers and kind of the tier twos. Um, but I think we're gonna start to see uh, their investment in uh, the components controls, especially categories with uh, more IP related uh, and investment. But, I think one of the things that the private equity community is going to need to get their arms around is probably the investment uh, horizon, right? Typically, it's a four to five year uh, in, uh, investment, and we know that our super cycles tend to be, you know, eight, nine, 10, 12 years in length. And so that's going to have to be one of the uh, fundamental discussions with these private equity partners that are going to be coming in is a little bit longer of a horizon or some, 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 some further confidence that they can give to the partners. But uh, the money's there, the will is there, and I think even from 20, even 10 years ago, the expertise is there um, to really help uh, improve the segment. So um, I think that's going to be the big question is kind of investment horizon, but uh, they're going to play a part in the, uh, the design and IP uh, kind of going forward uh, with uh, some of these component and control companies I'd see. Uh, Alex, Aviation Week had a webinar yesterday on the propulsion industry, and, and we looked into there's a lot of talk of game-changing technologies in the next one to two decades. And in propulsion, um, we all know that the French government has mandated that Airbus develop a, a clean, you know, carbon neutral airplane by uh, 2035. There's talk of, of electric propulsion and off hydrogen. Are, are these new technologies as, as they come on going to uh, alter the supply chain? Uh, it, was that for me? Or? Yeah, I'll start with you. Um, I I think it could in the future, uh, and, and probably Jim and his team are, are, are a lot smarter than me on this, but I would say that um, some of those technologies are probably heavier than what the engine can actually, uh, so the, uh, the, the, cost, the cost benefit ratio of, a, of an engine with this new technology, I don't know if it's, is there right now or will be in the years to come. Um, so it, it's probably like what additive manufacturing was, you know, probably eight, eight or 10 years ago or even five or six years ago. So I think we'll start to see some of that maybe later in this decade. But uh, just what I see right now, I think it's more traditional technology uh, is, is kind of the predominant factor right now, at least what I see. Okay. Jim Pratt's doing great, obviously, with, with the GTF. Mm -hmm. uh, so I know you know, have no complaints there. Uh, but do you have any thoughts on that and what the future might hold? Yeah, in, in, in terms of how private equity is going to play with that, is that, is that, is that the question? And, 
and supply chain. Will, will it alter the supply chain if uh, you know the European governments are saying, "Hey, we want hydrogen-powered aircraft and clean aircraft"? And well, for, for, for sure, and I think any any every company, especially propulsion companies, are are working on their version of of the solution to that problem, whether it's a hybrid technology or for all, all electric and. Uh, you know, Prep Canada and, 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 and RTX have got lots of programs on that. Will, will it alter it? For sure. For sure. It's a reality that's in, that I believe is, is, is going to take time. That's my opinion. Probably starting with the, the, the smaller engine business, such as the, the Prep Canada portion of the, of, the, of the business. And I think it, it, will, it will evolve the, the, the supply chain because we've got to adapt to the, a more electric type environment. Um, and again, I think Raytheon is well positioned because we've got the uh, the, the Collins Aerospace side, 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 side of the house. So I think we're, we're more than well positioned to go and adapt to that. Okay, Alexandra, from where you sit, I mean, what, what, did the, what is the supply chain in, in Quebec looking like? Are they, um, there's obviously a lot of worry, as Michael said, survival's the name of the game now, right? I, I, I think you're right, survival's the name of the game. Uh, from what we, we see uh, it's not that bad i mean people understand that uh things are not going to be back to normal tomorrow morning or next year and, and they're bracing for long-term changes they're reviewing their cost structure and they're uh finally able to uh, to to address these uh cost improvement and continuous improvement project that have been delayed for for quite a few years uh but, uh, you know, it, it's not as bad as what we, we originally thought. Uh, I, as I said, as, as the payroll protection programs and, and payroll subsidies programs are going to be tapered off, maybe, maybe we'll start to see more and more companies in trouble. Uh, but at this time, it's, it's better than we expected. Okay, thank you. Uh, final question, because we're, we're running down to our, our last minutes. Michael Bruno, this is something you've addressed, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to aim it at you. Uh, there's a reviewer who wants to know, will Spirit uh, Aerosystems close on its, its deal to buy uh, Bombardier's you know, aerostructures and ASCO? I love being put on the spot, but I'm going to gamble uh, an answer that says yes. And I believe Spirit Aerosystems is going to go ahead with both the ASCO and the Bombardier Aerostructures acquisitions for a big reason. And that big reason starts with B, Boeing. It's They need to diversify away from Boeing, which is responsible for about 80% of their annual revenue. And they needed to do it before the MAX crisis and before COVID-19. And Tom Gentili, the CEO there, has been very transparent about his desire to diversify the revenue stream. Um, they've already got a good track record of reducing the price of an acquisition. They did it with the ASCO, uh, particularly after that company got hit by a cyber attack. And so the expectations are with Bombardier, they'll probably seek some, some type of price reduction. But as recent as the last uh, second quarter teleconference call, uh, the spirit leaders were indicating that they needed to go through with it. And um, not just because they had already signed a contract, basically, that would be hard to back out of, but it's, it's strategic for them. And I think they want to. Okay. Well, Michael, Jim, Alexander, Alex, thank you. Uh, this, this conversation went way too fast, but it was very insightful. And uh, we really appreciate you taking the time to share your insights with our, with our audience. And with that, I'm going to hand it back to Kevin to wrap things up. Thank you, Joe. So yeah, once again, thank you, Joe, Michael, Jim, Alexander, and Alex for being with us today. Uh, no doubt that uh, our participants have learned a lot today. So everyone stay tuned uh, as Air Montreal will host its uh, second webinar on September 10 under the theme, Can Government Make Aviation Sustainable? Uh, organized once again in collaboration with Aviation Week. So we look forward to welcoming you in large numbers and on behalf of Aero Montreal, thank you.